Hello, P Street people, and whoever else might be joining us for the Sunday night Bible class. Uh, you might be tuning into this, watching it right when it goes live, or you might be watching a recording of it. But over the last several um, Sunday nights, we've been engaged in a study on the book of Colossians. And obviously, we're going to continue um, thinking about that book, another another section of it this evening. Here is the, um, the outline that I kind of put together that's actually morphed a little bit as I've studied through the book. You know, I try to get it outlined as best I can, you know, going into a study uh, to give people an overview. But then I start working through it and I start realizing that ah, I might have liked to have stopped that section here or started that section here. And so really, I've extended the section on the supremacy of Christ. Originally, I had it stopping at 2-3, and now I've got it going to 2-7, okay? Um, and here, here is um, sort of how we're breaking down the supremacy of Christ, because then we'll, we're kind of doing it topical, and then we'll move to the sufficiency of Christ and then submission to Christ. But we've seen that Christ is preeminent in creation, and that's verses 15 through 17 in chapter 1. And then it moves to Christ being preeminent in redemption or reconciliation. And then from that section, we move into what we're going to look at uh, in, this, in this class, in this installment, is this idea of Christ preeminent in the church, supreme in the church. And this is really through the lens of Paul's ministry. Okay, there's a move from Christ, and you have a move to Paul and the church, and Paul and his ministry on behalf of the church uh, for the um, you know expansion of the church. But what you have, I think, is two main sections. So this would be probably a good thing to have your Bible open to Colossians. And you're going to see the first paragraph is 124 through verse 29. And then you're going to see a second paragraph pick up in 2-1. A lot of translations ended at 5, but I, I'm going to argue that we should extend it to 7. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why I've decided to go to 2-7 instead of stopping at 2-5 or earlier. Um, first... There seems to be almost a parallel. There's in 1, 20 through, uh, 21 through 23, there is sort of an application made to the Colossians and their redemption or reconciliation after a discussion of Christ and and the recon, sort of that global cosmic reconciliation where it says that, you know, he was, um, um, let me see, um, back up here in verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, and that there's a movement from that more cosmic reconciliation, we talked about this last week, to the Colossians reconciliation. And there's that exhortation to remain steadfast and to remain stable, right? Not shifting from the hope of the gospel. You have something very similar in 2, 6, and 7, as we'll see, where it's as if Paul is applying what he said in 124 through 2, 5 to the Colossians, to their lives. In fact, that uh, therefore that appears in 2.6, it's going to appear four more times. And the other four times, it's pretty clear that it's functioning as sort of an application of the subject to the Colossian Christians. So I'm, I'm going to work with 124 through 2.7. And now what I'm going to show you, um, you're not going to see my face for just a little bit because there is a, there is a lot here. Um, whether or not Paul actually intended a chiastic structure is highly debatable, borderlining on doubtful. But I found this treatment of the 24 through 28 and uh, through 29 and 2, 1 through 2, 5, that I thought, hey, this is helpful because it, it shows us sort of the flow of Paul's thought in a way. And it also highlights sort of the main features, the key ideas in this section. Uh, that and, and that's what we're going to use to break this passage down. But notice how this works. Again, with chiasm, 
you have an A and the A has an A prime. You have a B and then you have what's called a B prime and then you have the C, which is the center, okay? So here you've got in 124, that's what I've got labeled A, the apostle suffering for the sake of Christ's body. That's over and against the A with a little apostrophe down below, the apostle struggle empowered by Christ there at 129. And if I had more space, I would have put a, a space between... 129 and, and 2 1 here. Then you go back up and you got the B, the Apostles' Commission to present the Word of God, 125. The B prime, the Apostles' Commission to present everyone complete in Christ. And then the center is the Apostles' message, the glorious riches of the mystery, which we'll have to talk about. But notice how that parallels the second paragraph starting at 2 1. We have the Apostles' struggle uh, for the Colossians whom he has not seen. Um, and we'll talk something about that. Again, this is not original with me. It's what I found in, I believe it was Garland's commentary. And even this is based on someone else's work that he's citing. But then you have the apostles' presence with them in spirit, though absent in body. So it's like, I haven't seen you. I'm not there physically. That's the thoughts that seem to be maybe parallel there. But then in the insight here, we have uh, the Apostles' Commission to encourage and bring understanding over against the Apostles' Commission to prevent them from being deceived. And then in the middle, the Apostles' message, just like in that first paragraph, it's the mystery of God, which here is summarized essentially in one word, and that is Christ. So there, this is just to show you there's some parallels that are going on here. There's some similar thoughts in both sections and so when you, you kind of take all that together, you can come up with the key features. And so instead of treating this passage where we start in 124 and we have an outline that just takes you right through the passage, we're going to be kind of piecing passages together that are connected, you see, and be more of a topical treatment of 124 through 27. So having said that, we're going to start with this, Paul's afflictions or sufferings for Christ's church. And that does start in 124. And so Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Uh, Jesus told Ananias, and you've got to go back to Acts 9, Ananias is the one that would come to the blinded Paul. Ananias is sent to Paul after Jesus had appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And Jesus told Ananias about how much Paul was going to suffer. And here's what we read in Acts 9, 15 through 16. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And suffer, Paul did. Um, 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen through 33, if we had time, we would walk through that passage. But it is probably the, the single best passage that catalogs all of the suffering that Paul endured in his ministry and on behalf of Christ. And even as the Colossians are reading this letter, uh, Paul is in prison. Uh, Paul's suffering, as you can see here, was for the sake of Christ's body, which is the church. And all that Paul suffered was for the spreading of the gospel, for the strengthening of Christ's disciples, for the strengthening of Christ's churches. I don't think Paul enjoyed the suffering per se. Suffering isn't pleasant, but he certainly appreciated and rejoiced in the in, in what those sufferings accomplished okay there is as we'll mention in a moment the solidarity that Christ would f or that Paul would feel with Christ in the midst of his suffering but Paul you know the, the, Paul's suffering vindicated the truth of what Paul was preaching uh, you know Paul was claiming that he had seen the resurrected Christ, that, you know, that, that Jesus is the way, as it were. And he's trying to connect the Old Testament and show Jews and, and of course, even preaching to Gentiles 
uh, even though he'd have to vary his message a little bit with them, he did his best um, to, to present the truth. And, and some of that's based on his own testimony of what he had experienced. I mean, he in Acts 22 and Acts 26, he takes us back, you know, in Luke's recording of, uh, of the history there when Paul is called to the carpet, you know, when he's making his defenses against Roman leaders. Um, he would go back to Acts 9, as it were, would reflect on what's recorded for us in Acts 9, I should say. And here's, here's the thing. The fact that Paul was willing to suffer as much as he was willing to suffer demonstrated that Paul knew what he had seen. He knew the truth of, of what he was proclaiming. And he was willing, in fact, to die for what he had seen. Okay? Um, and, and that... That undergirds the truthfulness of the gospel, and it also his suffering provided an example for the churches. You know that as they suffer, they can look to Paul's suffering, and and even beyond that to Christ's suffering, and they realize, okay, hey, I'm not alone in this suffering. There's encouragement to endure. There's an example to follow. It's weird, but it is. One of the teachings all throughout Scripture that we are to rejoice in our sufferings. And Paul is suffering, as it were, for the church at large, which would have included the Colossian Christians. Now, much has been written about Paul's claim that he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Um, There have been some pretty ingenious interpretations of this. Paul certainly did not mean that Jesus, you know, had, or that Jesus' death was an inadequate sacrifice that needed further suffering to make it complete. That's a ludicrous idea. Uh, But some have construed it to be that way, that Paul is filling up what, you know, Christ didn't quite suffer enough. So in order to, what, make full atonement for people's sins, Paul's filling up what was lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Um, the, that thought is at odds with, you know, the theme, for instance, of the book of Hebrews, which is saying, hey, it was a once-for-all, sufficient, non-repeatable sacrifice. There is nothing about what Paul's saying here that we should take in, in the sense that Jesus' sacrifice or sufferings were incomplete. Um, the thought is that Paul was completing what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ in his own flesh. So one writer by the last name of Holden comments, it is not Christ's sufferings which are being completed, but Christ's sufferings in Paul. And what is lacking or incomplete is Paul's own experience of Christ's afflictions, not something defective in Christ's sufferings. It's as if Paul is rejoicing because what he now suffers on behalf of Christ's church it's like it's allowing him to pay off the balance of his debt, as it were. Um, and this is an interesting sort of theme in Paul's. It's not as if Paul had to earn his salvation through what he suffered. That's not it. But Paul, in a sense, you know, he even viewed his own sufferings as, as almost unified with Christ's sufferings. I mean, he would say things like, I bear on my body, it's the end of Galatians, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The marks there is a Greek word that means stigmata, which has been the basis for some pretty interesting films and and, and even some uh, sort of Christian folklore. Um, but, but, you know, Paul, in his suffering, he identified with Christ in an incredible way, 
in those in those moments of his suffering so that he could call them Christ's afflictions or Christ's sufferings, even though those sufferings were taking place in his own body and in, in his own experience. Um, and then we move to, just as we're keeping this topical, here's a mention of struggle, Colossians 2, 1. And we went ahead and put in this with verse 5 because it's kind of a parallel thought. But for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Paul's sufferings or struggles are just as much for those churches in the Lycus Valley as they are for any other churches in Asia Minor or elsewhere. Okay? And you could argue that three groups are in view here. There's the Colossians, there is the Laodiceans, and it's those that have not seen him or have not personally met Paul. Um, some take it as if he's talking to the Colossians and the Laodiceans and then further explains that these are folks who have not seen me face to face. It seems as if there were some folks in the Lycus Valley who had personally met Paul, but certainly not all of them. And, you know, though Paul had not personally met all of them, and and, and in, at this point in writing this letter is presently distant from them, okay, I'm absent in body, he says. He wants the Colossian Christians to know that he is invested in their spiritual lives and is pleased and encouraged by their, you know, spiritual stability. You see, I'm with you in spirit, and he rejoices to see their good order and their firmness of faith, which are kind of military terms, really, um, kind of a military imagery to them. But he, again, yeah, he hasn't met all of them, and he's not presently with them. And, and what we can gather, he didn't necessarily, f f you know, he wasn't the founder of this church. Epaphras seems to be that. But here he is making sure they understand that the struggles that he goes through are just as much for them as for anybody else. And then we have the second sort of topic here, and that's Paul's commission as God's servant. So notice here in Colossians 1.25, of which, now we go back to verse 24, it just left off with the church. So the church of which, Paul says, I became a minister of, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Paul again identifies himself as a servant. Uh, that is the word um, translated minister here. He is a servant. He is a minister. Here he is the servant of the church. Earlier, back up, and I think 123, he designated himself a servant of the gospel, a minister of the gospel, and ending in 123 with that thought is what's led him to discuss his ministry, starting in verse 24, by the way. Um, notice that he, he views this in terms of a, of a stewardship. We understand, I think, the concept of a, of a steward. It's like, hey, this church for instance, doesn't belong to Paul, but he serves as a steward or a manager of it, as it were. He's, he's been, he is a steward, has been commissioned to carry out an assignment for his master, uh, for the church, on behalf of the church that belongs to his master. And according here to 125, his commission was to make the word of God fully known, to make the Word of God fully known. There's been some ways that's been understood. Um, one is that the phrase, to make the Word of God fully known, uh, which is literally, if we were to get literal in a translation, unto you to fulfill the Word of God, which is, translations try to smooth that out. Unto you to fulfill the Word of God is a little... Uh, stilted and, and a little confusing. So the way the ESV has it, it's almost like Paul was charged with preaching the whole counsel of God, making it fully and completely known. That's completely, uh, you know, the, 
an idea that, that could work here. The phrase may point to finishing an assignment, you know, fulfilling an assignment by making the word of God known. And some have taken the phrase to, to refer to Paul's role in fulfilling certain Old Testament prophecies in the Old, you know, in the Old Testament um, relative to the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's plan of redemption. Uh, which is what's, you know, where Paul's going to go here in, in verse 26 when we look at our next sort of topic. Um, and then we move from 125 where there's this idea that Paul's been commissioned to make the word of God fully known uh, to this one here in 128-29. Him, which is Christ, Paul says, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So the goal here, let's see if I can get, there we go, that works. The goal here of Paul's preaching, of his teaching, of his admonishing, which can have a hint of warning or even correction and rebuke, all of this is to present everyone mature in Christ. Uh, some translations render it perfect in Christ, which can be a bit misleading uh, for, I think, modern readers. You know, the Greek idea of perfection uh, was something without a flaw, you know. And, and that's probably influenced our understanding of the word perfect. Uh, for the Hebrew, though, um, to fulfill one's purpose um, is, is, is the concept of perfect, uh, to wholeness, maturity. Um, if you're wholehearted and if you're sincere in a right relationship to God, that's described as perfect in Scripture, complete. Uh, mature is, I think, a, a, the best translation here. It's an issue of maturity. It's an issue of wholeness. It's an issue of completeness, not flawless perfection. That we are not babies in Christ, that we are mature, full-grown adults in Christ. That that's what Paul's goal was. I might even say transformation to Christ's likeness, into Christ's likeness. Notice everyone is mentioned three times here. Warning everyone, teaching everyone, that may present everyone mature in Christ. So a couple of thoughts here. Paul's mission extended to, you got it, everyone. No exception. Now he's looking to warn everyone. He's looking to proclaim this to everyone, to all humankind. And then secondly, everyone, not just a charm circle, not just some religious elite, everyone is to become mature in Christ. That ought to be the goal for every Christian is maturity in Christ. Not, you know, not, hey, that's, that's reserved for the especially spiritual or the especially religious. No, everyone, Paul says. I'm looking to present everyone mature in Christ and creating full-grown Christians, uh, well-rounded Christians, was the goal of Paul's ministry. That's what he struggled to, you know, complete. That was his aim. He worked hard, as he says here in verse 29, toiling after this. And, and it's an interesting sort of play on words here. He's expending energy even as God energizes him. You know, there is that kind of goes back to that um, both and of of both discipline and dependence of my work and God's work or God being at work in my work. Uh, so uh, he he is relying, as it were, on God to strengthen him and energize him for his ministry. And then we move to yet another part that could, we, we're going to put in this section of Paul's commission here as God's servant. 
their hearts may be encouraged. Uh, he's looking to encourage or comfort their hearts. He's looking to bind them, to strengthen the bonds of love uh, among them that they, you know, that they hold uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And notice here to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding. All of these things are necessary in bringing others to maturity in Christ. And by becoming mature in Christ, notice this, they will not be deceived. They will not be duped by arguments, no matter how persuasive or how plausible they may sound. Uh, verse 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Um, and by the way, uh, that verse 4 kind of really points us to what the section we'll look at next week where we begin to see what some of these folks in Colossae were saying, whether it's in the church, out of the church, but there was, as we talked about way back in our first lesson, that there was some heresy or heresies afoot and that Paul is seeking to protect them from. And obviously by pushing towards maturity in Christ, they will not be easily deceived by these false teachers. So if you're kind of summing up Paul's commission as it's kind of been presented in, in these passages, he, he talks about presenting the word of God in its fullness. He talks about presenting everyone mature in Christ. And then there at the end, there's that idea of preventing Christians, uh, the Colossians in particular, from being deceived or led astray by false teachers. And so now we move to the third of, uh, let me bring this up on the big screen here, um, Paul's proclamation of God's menace, mystery, okay? And um, so a few of the passages under Paul's commission, we kind of cut off because he's, in, in both cases, there is going to be this reference to the mystery of God that Paul is proclaiming, that Paul is preaching, that Paul is revealing. And this is an interesting subject that's worth kind of isolating here. And it and this is where Colossians and even the book in the book of Ephesians hold hands. So here is the um, here's the passage, the first one here. Um, the mystery. So he's talking about, in the context, uh, he talked about to make the word of God fully known. And then I've got a comma. And then it's like, okay, here's what he's making known. Here's what he's revealing. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now that, listen, Paul was great at writing really long sentences that English translations try to break up, but he just starts, he gets these genitives going, of the glory, of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's got, got a lot of ofs, which are genitives, you know, um, in, in the Greek. Uh, but let's let's notice mystery here. You know, in modern parlance, contemporary, you know, thought, a mystery is sort of like a who done it or some impenetrable puzzle. In the Colossians, even in the Colossians pagan environment, you had mystery religions, and this referred to information about initiatory rites and symbols that were kept from the uninitiated. Okay. Um, they were kept a mystery, as it were. And so you had, even today, we have some groups that, that kind of have this, um, you know, they hold some esoteric knowledge, uh, things that you don't get to learn unless you are initiated, you know. Um, that is not certainly how Paul is using the word mystery here. It's certainly not in sort of our contemporary understanding of a mystery. Paul's use of the word mystery accords more with Jewish usage. The mystery is something related to God's purpose, which can only be imparted by divine revelation. 
And, you know, it's like humans cannot discover it. Humans cannot know it unless it is revealed. And and from a New Testament perspective, the, the mystery refers to a secret once hidden that has now been made known through the apostles and and the prophets in the in the you know sort of new covenant era okay you know abraham received a preview of it the prophets of old caught glimpses of it but the apostles lived in the time of its fulfillment and they were the ones to unveil the mystery as it were and what is the mystery well the key element that is stressed in this text and is also a big deal in uh, in the in the book of Ephesians, and so I would highly recommend reading Ephesians three verses one through ten in connection with this passage. You know, if you're a note taker, get Ephesians three one through ten. I mean, these passages really kind of inter uh, interlock and and help it kind of explain one another. But the key element of this mystery is the riches of God's glory are among the Gentiles. That this salvation. Uh, endeavor is not just for God's chosen people, the Jews, but that it extends beyond the Jews to all nations. Christ in you, Paul says, which many many refer to that as the indwelling Christ. Some like to argue for Christ among you, whether it's in you or among you. It's the fact that these Colossians who are Gentiles, probably mainly I would say, and and all the, the nations, all the non-Jews can have this relationship with Jesus Christ and that they can find salvation and that they too can have this hope of glory that is only found in Christ. Uh, the mystery revealed is that anyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, may apprehend, may become uh, a Christian, a follower of Christ, and thereby be saved. Uh, and then when you get to the down here in the second paragraph, remember we kind of have two paragraphs we're dealing with, 124 through 129, 2, 1, and then we're finishing it at 2, 7, though a lot of translations start at kind of a new paragraph at 2.6 and end the other paragraph at 2.5. But notice how this parallel, and the knowledge, so in 2.1, that the hearts may be encouraged, being knit together, love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Um, here, Paul just sums up the mystery in one word, Christ. H.C. Jumul states, he says, Jesus, as seen in his life and teaching, is the revelation of the mystery that had been hidden throughout previous generations. Prophecies in the Old Testament give hints of his coming and of the nature of his work, but the veil of mystery remained until he came into the world. Because of his coming, God's true knowledge is now available in Jesus. So earlier in the previous paragraph, the mystery really was centered on the inclusion of the Gentiles. And you could argue, well, here the same thought is, is, is being set forth that, you know, God's plan worked through Christ to incorporate in one body, both Jew and Gentile had been kept secret in ages past, but was revealed to and by the apostles, you know, and so you could kind of conflate all of it or you could just say here he just wants to focus on christ and truly the identity of christ the sufferings of christ the full significance of the christ the fact that the christ would be god's son i.e god himself you know all of that stuff was prophesied and was discussed but man it really took revelation. It really took unfolding all of this for people to see it, for people to appreciate it. I mean, Paul, he had to work hard, especially in those his ministry with the Jews, of trying to show them that the Christ prophesied in the Old Testament in the scriptures they knew well is, in fact, Jesus of Nazareth. 
and to make those connections, you know. And so here it may be Paul's just thinking, hey, let's just focus on Christ here. But I do find it interesting. The word mystery is found in that previous paragraph, and it's found in the second paragraph. And the first one, it's really specific, you know. It's the inclusion of the Gentiles and God's plan of redemption. And here it's Christ, notice, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Um, I don't think Paul meant that the Colossians or any of us for that matter can, you know, would be able to comprehend all of Jesus's teachings and wisdom in God's storehouse as it were fully and perfectly. But at, at the very least, he is saying that that he wants them to understand, the Colossians understand, that all wisdom, all knowledge uh, that is most important is hidden in Christ and can be found nowhere else. You know, for this reason, the Colossians weren't to look anywhere else. That Jesus and the, the treasure trove of wisdom and knowledge that he reveals and that he brings to us, which is now we have in Scripture, that that is sufficient. And and I think this is kind of preemptive to what Paul's going to talk about in the next big section in chapter 2. And that is these false teachings that are threatening, perhaps, to lure some of these uh, Christians in Colossae away. Um, let's look at the last little section here, okay? And that is Paul's application to the Colossians' lives. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people like to end this discussion at 2.5. A lot of commentaries will end it at 2.5, but I found a few that went ahead and, and discussed 6 and 7 in combination of what we've just looked at. And I think there's good reason to do so. So here's what Paul says, therefore. Okay, I think in light of what I, you know, it's like Paul, in light of what we've just said about my ministry to the churches and what all of that is involved, uh, here's what he says. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Uh, the clause there, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, speaks, I think, to becoming a Christian. And what follows speaks to staying or remaining a Christian. And so this is actually Paul's second call to be firmly rooted in the faith. And we saw that back up in 123. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Um, so here is, again, another call to remain firmly established in the faith. You know, having entered Christ, the Colossians are to walk in him or, or live in him. Having been planted, they are, you know, they are to grow roots, they are to grow deep roots. It's kind of an agricultural image. Having, you know, been built on a foundation, uh, they are to build on that foundation, which is, again, some architectural imagery there. And having become beneficiaries of God's grace, they are to overflow. They are to abound in thanksgiving. David Garland wrote, Those who bubble over with gratitude for what God has already done, are not easy prey to anxiety and doubt. They have no need or desire to look for fulfillment elsewhere and cannot be taken in by false promises or shaken by false teachers or detractors. Um, and so, again, the Thanksgiving is a theme that appears in all four chapters in the book of Colossians, and it's true, if we're thankful, truly thankful for what God did for us in Christ, it's going to be hard to be pulled away from Christ, right? It's going to be hard to, to shift from the gospel, to use that language in 123. It's going to be much easier 
to remain steadfast and stable and rooted and established in the faith in Christ. Um, I want to close by just looking very, very briefly at just some preaching points that arise from a study of this section, 124 to 27. Recall again that we took more of a topical approach, right? So we saw kind of discuss Paul's afflictions or sufferings for um, for Christ's church. And we looked at Paul's commission as God's servant. And we looked at Paul's proclamation of God's mystery and had some idea about what that's about. And then, and then finally Paul's application of all of that to the lives of the Colossians, um, the Christians there at Colossae. But here are some, uh, here are just very briefly some preaching points that I think um, fit this section. One, we must be willing to endure suffering for the sake of the gospel and the church. Um, Paul did. Uh, Jesus did. Um, in fact, most of the apostles did. A lot of our first century brothers and sisters suffered for their faith. Paul expected everyone to suffer for their faith. Jesus seemed to to uh, to expect the same as well. And and that's because we live in a world where people do not appreciate Christ, do not appreciate uh, His message do not appreciate his call to allegiance, his call to listen to him and not just hear him, but also do what he says. Some people hate being told what to do. Uh, they like to be their own masters, their own captains of their soul. And we also live in a culture that's all about trying to minimize pain, uh, you know, uh, trying to minimize suffering. And so why would I want to be a part of something that may very well bring suffering with it? Um, that's just the way a lot of people think. But Paul rejoiced in his suffering, and Paul was willing to undergo whatever he had to for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church, Christ's church. It should be no different for us. Here's another idea. The goal of the gospel is Christ-likeness. You know, I, I really, really love um, what Paul says there in Colossians 1.28 that he is looking to present everyone mature in Christ. I think about Galatians 4.19, where he says, I am at labor again, that Christ might be formed in you. And I think about Paul in Galatians 2.20 saying, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so when we become Christians, we are babes in the faith. We're babies. We're, we're infants. And there's, it's the beginning, right? But there's a growth that is to take place. And one day, you know, if we get sort of looking on down the line, um, the hope is that when we stand before um, Jesus, the judgment, that he will see himself in us. That is uh, something, something to think about right there. The goal of the gospel. Yeah, the goal of the gospel is to save us, right? I get that in, in a sense, to, to go to heaven. But so often um, it's cast in this idea of becoming like Jesus. And one day in glorification being fully conformed to Christ uh, in his glorious body, as it were. Uh, and then here is the, um, the third one. We should appreciate the universality of the gospel and the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, those are two sort of big ideas that come to us from this section that, hey, this mystery is the inclusion of the Gentiles along with the Jews. It's the fact that Jews and everyone else uh, can become recipients of Jesus, that, they, that the gospel is something they need to hear and they need to take seriously. Uh, Paul saw his mission. I mean, Paul's commission was primarily to the Gentiles. He did work among the Jews, but 
he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And, uh, and that was a, a mystery, so to speak, that was revealed by his teaching and revealed certainly by his work, not to mention the work of others, and then the sufficiency of Christ. We, that, that we are so firmly rooted in him, that we are so devoted to him, that we are so thankful to him, that we aren't duped, deceived, uh, derailed by any other teaching that might take us away from Christ or that might try to supplant Christ with something else or add something to you know, what Christ has, uh, has called us to. And, and that was something that the Colossians were evidently in, in danger of that, that prompted Paul to write this letter as we're going to see more in the next section starting at 2.8 and going essentially through the rest of that chapter. So I invite you back next week as we, um, as we think a little bit more about the book of Colossians. And we, this is where we'll start to uh, discuss a little bit more in depth the so-called Colossian heresy, which might be better Colossian heresies. Okay? So with that, uh, I want to thank you for watching and hope that something we've studied tonight's been helpful to you, uh, clarifying to you, perhaps even challenging to you. Again, thanks for watching. May God bless you this week.